shadows, bound for the gallows, a dead man walking, to love came calling, rise up, rise up, rise up, rise up, six feet under.
worship with us if you'd like. Nothing can separate. Nothing can separate. Even if I ran away, your love never fails. I know I still make mistakes, but you have new mercies for me every day. Your love never fails. You stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid. Because I know that you love me. Your love never fails. The wind is strong and the water's deep, but I'm not alone here in these open seas. Your love never fails. The chasm is far too wide. I never thought I'd reach the other side. Your love never fails. You stay the same. You stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And we oceans rage I don't have to be afraid because I know that you love me your love never fails you make all things work together for my good you make Stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid. Because I know that you love me. Your love never fails. Your love never fails. Amen. Amen. Yeah. 
mightiest lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before him. songs are an extension of our prayer. Lord, help us to keep them in our hearts and to know that no one can stop you. Nothing happening in the world can stop your plan from happening. And that's just a fact. And you're going to do your will and you're going to have your way. And in fact, Jesus already died for our sins. So we have all the world, everything in the future to look forward to, Lord. And that's being with you. And I pray that we can hold on to that in this time. And Jesus, thank you for blessing us with the opportunity to worship you today. In Jesus' name, we all pray. Amen. And go ahead and be seated if you would. We're going to do something a little bit differently this morning. Um, we've been utilizing our tables in the back and kind of focusing a little bit on some of our youngest ones among us. And we're excited to have kids in our worship service through the summer and with us in kind of a family style. Let's give the kids a hand for being just with us and it's great to, to love on them. And we want to do something really special today because we want you to all help participate with them in a memory verse option. Bar Sister Barbara, come on up here. And some of you kiddo helpers, William and you got your job there, buddies, Connor, come on up. For the microphone, for the for the people at home. <laughs> You're on Facebook. 
Facebook Live. <laughs> Connor, will you pass one of those out to those who want it? I'll keep one. Okay, here we go. Just give them to Papa. Okay, so I believe memory verses are super, super important. There was a time when I got really depressed. It's been over a decade ago, and I would open up my Bible, and the words were nothing to me. I hate to admit it, but that's exactly what happened. I would, I'd look at those words, and they wouldn't penetrate, but... I had memorized scripture, and it was the words written on my heart that saw me through times when nothing else was working. So I've been memorizing scripture for a long time now, and I think we can all do it. If our children see that it's important to us, then they will get on board as well. So I don't want this to be just for the kids. I want all of us to work together, and when the kids see us, interested in memorizing the scriptures, then they'll join us in it. So Connor and William have decided to help me. Well, actually, they were. <laughs> they, they, they said they'd help me. Um, and it's a good thing, because I'm holding this. You guys are going to have to do the hand motions when, when I can't, okay? So our memory verse is Psalm 139. Now, through this summer, We're going to learn verses 1 through 14, but today we're just going to learn. I have a tremor. This is not nerves, so don't feel sorry for me. When I grip something, it causes my hand to shake, so don't think I'm nervous. Well, I am, but don't (laughs) think I am. (laughs) Okay, so um, I also like to use rhythm um, when we're learning a memory verse. So I'm going to say the first line. And you guys are going to say it after me. And we're going to do that first with the rhythm. Then we're going to say it one more time. And we'll do some hand motions with it. Okay? So we're going to go like this. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and you know me. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. When I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You perceive my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. You are familiar with all my ways. Okay, Asia and Ethan and Brody and... All the other kiddos, I want you to watch. We're going to help us remember these words. Wait a minute. What did perceive mean, William? We said you perceive my thoughts from afar. What does perceive mean? You don't know? Connor, what does perceive? You don't know either? Does anybody know what perceive means? It's another fancy word for no. No, I love Yep, I know. And it said you discern my going out and my lying down. What's... What does discern mean? No, yeah, you got it. Understand, we're just going to think no. So, oh, Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. I stood up too soon. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Okay, I think that's it for today. You guys got it? Anybody want to say it with me? Okay. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Yay. Give her a hand. Good going, guys. Excellent. I'll put this down here. Well, um, let's move a little bit into the portion of our service where we remember the Lord through 
the Lord's Supper. If you have uh, communion elements, a little um, opportunity in a container, they're on the two sides. If you need one, let me know or let us know and we'll grab one for you. As we've uh, jumped into scripture already and spent a, a little bit of time there memorizing it, think about God's thoughts after you and he loves you so much. And that's the portion of our service where we zero in on that. Who we are in him, his uh, identity for us, how he's created us to be his kids, to be his adopted children. You know, in John chapter 17, Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was praying in the Garden prior to his going to the cross. And you ever think about what was it that was paramount in Jesus' mind? What was first and foremost in his heart? It was us. A number of things. One of the things he said was, my prayer for you, Father, to you, Father, is not that you would take my disciples out of the world, but that you would protect them from the evil one. You know, we're living in this world through some pretty challenging times. This has been an amazing couple, three or four months of challenge. But Jesus didn't pray, oh, get them out of the world. He said, no, I'm not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. And then the next things he began to talk about was our relationships with one another, was our unity. In fact, we're going to focus for the next little bit on the unity in the body of Christ. He says, my prayer is for those who believe on me through the apostles' word, that they may all be one, Father, as you and I are one. May they also be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. Our unity, our heart together, our oneness, our being a team and being believers together is a direct testimony and witness to what God's wanting to accomplish. He's laying his life down. He says that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them even as I have loved them. That's the essence of this meal. That's the essence of these emblems, is to remember the love that Jesus has for us. He died on the cross. He was buried in a tomb, and he rose on the third day to show victory over the grave, to show victory over hell, to show victory for our lives and our unity. He died so we could experience oneness with the Father, and oneness with one another. Take a minute just now and ask the Lord, is there anything in your life, anything in your world, anything in your heart that needs to be assessed and addressed at this time? This is the perfect time for that. On a regular basis, just to say, Lord, tune me up. Lord, tune me in. Especially if there's anything that is a disruption in your unity in the body of Christ. This is a great time to reflect, remember, and reconcile. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the night that he was betrayed, that he thought of us and brought forth this emblematic meal that we could remember the body that was broken for us, the blood that was spilled for us, and, Lord, that it would bring us together in unity. Lord, that you would bring hearts from a diverse, radically changing group. And you would bring us all together around the one and singular thing that is Jesus and his love. Jesus and his blood. Jesus and his heart for us. Lord, as we do that today, we thank you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the unity in the body of Christ. We thank you for loving us the way that you do. We surrender ourselves anew to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and peel back the foil for the uh, bread that represents the broken body of the Lord Jesus. Let's partake together. Thank you, Lord.
Jesus. Let's peel back the foil for the remembrance of the fruit of the vine. Remember Jesus as you partake. Yes, Lord, we love you. We honor you. We thank you today. And we pray all this in Jesus' sweet name. Amen. Let's stand together one more time, and we're going to sing of uh, the, our identity. We are who he says we are. We are adopted children in the kingdom of God. We are one because of him. Father's house, in my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes I am, and I am chosen, not forsaken, and I am who you say I am, you are for Forsaken, and I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me, and I am who you say I am. And I am, and I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of. Yes, I am my father's house. In my father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes I am. Amen, Lord. God, you've given us Jesus so that we can be reconciled to you, Lord, that we can be brought to you, that we can seek you, that we can get to know you through your word, through scripture. Lord, thank you for, for offering yourself to us so that we can offer ourselves back to you and that we can experience freedom from sin and shame and freedom from our past, Lord, that we can be free from that. Lord, thank you for the blessings that you give us and the freedom that you give us. In Jesus' name we all pray, amen. May have a seat.
testing. Okay. All right. So in my training hike, I decided to go to Mount Eleanor, which I normally wouldn't go to Mount Eleanor alone, especially this time of year because the snow is melting out. It's a bad time to go because it gets a little dangerous because it's half snow, half melt, and you fall through and into the and people die. All right, so a bad place to go, but for some reason I said that's where I'm going to go. So, I, so I'm, I'm on Mount Eleanor. I'm hiking up Mount Eleanor. This guy, this guy is about 100 yards ahead of me up the hill. So I'm kind of watching him, and I'm kind of going. I figure as long as he's still alive, I'm going to still be alive. He'll be good, okay? Because, like I said, it's a dangerous place to go. Not a lot of people there. Ended up there was four people, me, this guy, and, and another couple was all that was on the mountain, well, that high up on the mountain anyway. There are a lot of people down low. So I finally catch up to this guy because he stopped for lunch just before we got to the top. I'm not a stop for lunch kind of guy. I'm a, I'm a point A to point B, so I just go straight to the top. But he was sitting there, and I came up to him, and we started chatting. I told my wife this, and she's like, you, you chatted with somebody? <laughs> if you know me, I'm not a real talkative kind of guy. So just the fact that I'm talking to somebody on a mountain is kind of unusual. But I stopped, and, and we chatted for, for quite some time. And he was kind of checking his GPS to see where about the mountain was because there still was snow, uh, cloud covered, so we couldn't see where we were going. And so then he finally, we figured out about where it was, and then the clouds cleared, and I decided I'd go ahead and go up. So I went up, and then he came to the top later, and we chatted a little bit more. And I chatted with the other couple that was, what was up there. And then we headed down. I headed down before Robert did, and I was concerned about Robert because if you, if you know anything about climbing mountains, one of the fun things, fun, I say fun because it can be not fun, is to slide down the mountain once you've climbed up the mountain. Well, sliding down Mount Eleanor is a really, really bad idea, and he told me he was going to do it, and he would have died if he slid down the mountain, so I was concerned about him all the way down. But that was, that was just an, an encounter. Except a couple of days later, I get this message. What you don't know is two, about two weeks before I went on this hike, Terry set me aside at home group, after home group was over, and said, Mark, can you help me pray? Because I want to pray for a guy, because he, he really cared for this guy. This guy does not know God, and he needs to know God. He's a young guy. And I said, sure, I'll be happy to pray for you. And he says, you know, he likes mountaineering. He, he likes to hike and stuff, so I'd really like him to meet you. So we prayed. We prayed for, for this guy. Quite frankly, I didn't even remember his name, but I was praying, God, Terry's friend, that you'd give me a chance to meet Terry's friend. And little, lo and behold, I found out I met the guy. Two weeks after we prayed that I would meet this guy and have a chance to chat with him, God made, had met me and him on a mountain. That's how God works. What are the chances? What's the chances I'm going to meet the guy that Terry and I are going to pray about on a mountain an hour away from here with only four people on that mountain? He just happens to be one of them. So Terry talks about, the, he says, this Mark guy, I think he went on Mount Eleanor. He shows pictures. He says, that's the guy I met on the mountain. So then I texted Robert, one of the first things, whenever you're talking to somebody about God, is trying to convince them that there is, in fact, a God. Well, I don't have to convince Robert of that. <laughs> because I just said, God, you know, God made, we prayed about you and we met on the mountain. That is a God thing. And he says, absolutely, that is a God thing. You don't have to know God for God to apply. God loves Robert, even though Robert didn't know God. Now I have an opportunity, because introducing people to God, sometimes the hard thing, he's already been introduced to God, I just needed to introduce him to the church, that's God working. Has nothing to do with the sermon today, by the way, I just want to tell you that. Because <laughs> this is what God does. So let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll actually have the real sermon. God, you are incredible. Lord, so many times we talk about you like you are this creature or something from, from thousands of years ago. God, you are the creator for today, for yesterday, and for tomorrow. Lord, I pray that we would always remember that it is you, Lord, that we live under. 
Lord, it is your son that died on the cross for each and every one of us. Lord, it is your spirit that works in our lives every single day. Lord, never let us forget that. There's so many things of this world trying to distract us and trying to get our mind off of who you are. Lord, I pray that that does not happen. I pray that the church always remains under you and in your care and in your love because there is no greater love on this earth. Lord, we thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Bruce last week talked about community. He talked about the church being a community. That it is important on our Independence Day as we celebrate our independence. Our independence is not from each other. Our independence is not from God. All right, we don't in get independent. We're, it's just me. I'm just my self-made man. No, they were doing independence from another country. We'll talk about why they were doing independence from another country. We hold these truths to be self-evident. If you don't know where these words are from, these are from the Declaration of Independence. These truths to be self-evident. What do they mean? They mean the way we see it, this is common sense. Okay, this is what they're saying. We just know this to be true. God tells us that this is true. That we are all men, all men are created equal and that we are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. We have destroyed that word rights, by the way. We have made that word rights as something that we can just be selfish about, and it's something that's ours. That isn't what they were saying. They're talking about God here. They're talking about the creator. What they're saying here, that among these, and there's a lot more, that we just have because God created us. We have life and we have liberty. We have the opportunity to pursue happiness in God. We, we just have those things because God gave them to us. Not because a country gave them to us. Not because a government gave it to us. We already have that because God created us and that's what we have. We have the opportunity for life. We have the opportunity to be free. And we'll talk about that a little bit. The concept to them was, we're already free, not because Britain is going to let us be, not because we're going to create our own country. It's because God created us to be free. So what they told Britain is, you're standing in the way of that. You're standing in the way of God giving people the ability to live their lives out as they so choose to live their lives out, preferably. And the assumption was, unfortunately then, because it doesn't fall true now, the assumption was that you believed in God and that you followed God and that you got your liberty from God. That was just their assumption. So then we go almost 100 years later. This is a person talking to Abraham Lincoln, who was the president of the United States, talking about the Civil War. We're talking about the South battling the North. And he says, Mr. President, we trust during this time of trial in which this nation is engaged that God is on our side and he will give us the victory. How many times have you thought that about the things that you think? That God is on my side and he will give me the victory, so you better be on my side. <laughs> That's where our country is so much. And this is what Abraham Lincoln's response was to that man, sir, my concern is not whether or not God is on our side. My greatest concern is to be on God's side because for God is always right. So if we're not on God's side, then we're in a really, really bad place. Abraham Lincoln had a little problem with the church. And you know why he had a problem with the church? It's because he, 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 knew, he, he knew many men of God. And we're talking the Civil War here. We're not talking about all the men of God are on the north and all the men without God are on the south. We're talking he knew many men of God on both sides. And he didn't like the fact that some were so incredibly sure that they were right, that God was on their side. But they thought that on the north and they thought that on the south. And he knew that God was not on both sides. He, quite frankly, didn't know what the right side was. He took one side. He just prayed consistently that he was on God's side. 
And that's where we need to be. We need to be outside of ourselves and praying that we're on God's side because that's where liberty and freedom are. Liberty and freedom are not in your rights. They're not in you deciding you're going to be you. They are you deciding you're going to be with God. That's where liberty comes from. Now, the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And other, other versions say there is freedom. That's where freedom is, people. Freedom is not in the Constitution of the United States. Freedom is in God and his son who died for us. Our, four, our founding fathers understood that. However, when they started the Constitution, anybody know what the first words of the Constitution are? <laughs> we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. That's what they decided. So what did they do to just get a more perfect union? They come up with a lot of rules. <laughs> I'm going to tell you today how to form a more perfect union. It's not in rules. It's in God. We're going to talk about Ephesians 4, 1 through 6, because God is all about forming, having a perfect union. God has had a perfect union, by the way, for more than time allows. It's just us that mess that up. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, I want you to understand that he sees himself as free. What does he call himself? A prisoner. He can be a prisoner, he also calls himself a slave, but he considers himself the freest person there is, because he is a slave to God. I implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling for which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance with one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit of the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as you are called to one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of, of all who is over all and through all and in all. I want to point out what we're going to talk about today. God didn't tell you to form a more perfect union. God told you to preserve the unity of the spirit. The perfect union already exists. By the way, it's called the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's where the perfect union is. If the church would follow the Father, the Son of the Holy Spirit, we would be in perfect union. Unfortunately, we don't always go there. This is how you get there. Because if you listen to all of the ways the world tells you to get there, Understand the Bible is right when it says the way of man leads to destruction. Okay? All the ideas you hear out there on the way to form a more perfect union, because right now we don't have a very perfect union at all. And I think we can all agree on that. This is how you get there. This is how you being you, independent, but also dependent on the church and on God. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you. He's begging you. He does this a lot, by the way, begging the church. You need to do this. Walk in a manner worthy of which you've been called. With all humility, gentleness, patience, tolerance. And you've got to do all of those in love. Those are not rules to go by. That is the way you live. And you live it out of love. And we're going to start. It has to start with humility. Humility isn't, God, please bless what I've already decided to do. God, please bless my side. If God is always on your side, I would question who your God is. Okay? Start with humility. Start with understanding that you might be wrong. But God is, what did Abraham Lincoln said about God? God's always right. That's why I want to be on God's side, because he's always right. If I want to be on the right side, I've got to be on God's side. This is 
God talking to Solomon. If I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, if I command the locusts to devour the land, if I send pestilence among my people, and my people are called by my name and humble themselves. First thing you have to do is you have to humble yourself. You have to realize you might be the problem. And pray. What do you pray? The psalmist says a perfect prayer in this. It said, God, please search my heart and find if there's a wicked way in me. Because I'm too arrogant to know. So I just need to shut up and I need to listen to find out if there's something that I'm doing that I ought not be doing. If the way that I think is wrong, if the way I'm judging other people is wrong, whatever it is, you need to find out, first of all, God, am I on your side? That's where humility comes in. It's to say, God, I know that I am worthless without you. I am hopeless without you. I am a sinful man. See if there's any wicked ways in me that I don't even know about yet. Because I want to humble myself before you because it's your way that I want. And then once you humble yourself and you pray that, then you seek God. Because if you seek God before you humble yourself, you will not find him. You'll find a God, and again, you'll probably likely find a God that agrees with you 100%. Because we like that God. I've heard it said, you know, that God made man in his own image, and man's been doing, returning the favor ever since. We try to make God in our image. That's not the God we should be praying to. We should be praying to the God that knows that we might be wrong and we're willing to hear it. So we seek his face. And then when we pray that we f he finds any wicked way in us, and then we pray that he would show us and that we seek his face to find out who he is, then we are ready for step four where we can turn from those wicked ways and now we can follow him. And then once we do all of that, because, quite frankly, sometimes we do some of those different parts. Sometimes we turn from the wicked ways of, that we know about. Sometimes we humble ourselves, but we don't go to God. Sometimes we pray before we do any of that. We just pray, God, help us, and we don't even know what it is we need help for. When we do all of those things, then he'll hear from heaven. He'll forgive your sin, and he'll heal your land. And his eyes will be open, his ears will be attentive to your prayers. That's where it starts. That's where getting unity starts. Unity starts with you fixing yourself. Because you let God do the work. I don't know how many of you remember Promise Keepers. Promise Keepers was a wonderful thing where thousands, tens of thousands of men would come together just to worship Jesus Christ. And this was their concept. And I want you to grasp the concept. Because the concept was, if you can do this before God and let him change your life, then you can go home, and when your family sees this, you can impact your family. And then when you've impacted your family, and then the, the community sees your family, you can impact your community. And then when the nation sees your community, you can change your nation. And when the world sees your nation, you can change the world. But it starts with you humbling yourself. But what, when, what, what do you do when you know? What do you do when you know that you're right, that you know that you're on God's side? Well, first of all, how do you know? Well, you did that last part. You humbled yourself. You prayed to God. You sought his face. Now you know what is true. Then what do you do? Then it's when the gentleness kicks in. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome. It isn't about having a debate. It's about telling the truth and love. So you can all be on God's side. Be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth and that they come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. That's your goal, people. 
Your goal is not to convince them that you're right. Your goal, first of all, is to find out that you, whether or not you are right and get on the right, and then your goal is to bring them along so that they can now be in unity with God. You get you in unity with God, then you help those around you come in unity with God. That's your goal. And again, we're doing all of this in love. Your goal is not to pat yourself on the back and say, gee, I told you so. Your goal is to see them in heaven. Then it says be patient. Patience means as long as it takes. As long as it takes. So no matter how difficult it is. Not having faith in that person, but having faith in their God. Is Paul talking to the Philippian church? I thank God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayers with joy. And not because they're perfect. Every prayer for you, all of you, in view of your participation in the gospel. Praise God. I don't care if you're perfect. I'm not perfect. None of us are perfect. Praise God you're participating in the gospel. Would we all just at least get bought that bottom line? Praise God. You're, do, you, do you believe exactly how I do? Maybe, maybe not. Do you disagree on some things? Absolutely, probably so. But praise God we're participating in the gospel. From the first day until now, I'm, I just pray the whole time you've been participating in the gospel. And, and I'm not confident in you. I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. Let's look at people that way. Let's look at people that way, not, not hate, because we're always trying to fix people. We love to fix people. You know, if you just start doing this one thing better, you know, you'd be a better person. God's doing that work. Have confidence in God. God's doing the work in that person. God's doing the work in you. He's doing the work in all of us. But be patient. That, that work takes a long time for some people. All right? Still working on me. It's been a long time. And then tolerance. That's accepting the differences. We will have differences. Unity does not mean you don't have differences. There are differences between God and the Son and the Holy Spirit. There, there's differences. There's differences. We don't understand how they can be perfectly one and have differences, but they do. You can have differences. Two things I want to say about this. So you'll see another verse coming up here in a bit. Now, accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. Okay? That's, that's that agree to disagree kind of thing. I know you're wrong, but whatever. Okay? I'm okay that you're wrong. I'm good with you being wrong. As long as I'm right and someday you'll be on my side, that's not what it is. The disagreement does not mean right or wrong. The differences between Jesus and his father are not wrong. They're right 100% of the time. They're just different because they do different things. The father didn't die on the cross. The son did. Understand that we are different people and we believe some things that are different. One person has faith that he may eat all things. The other one is weak, eats vegetables only. I would argue that he's weak because he eats vegetables only, but that's not what the verse says. <coughs> all right, but I'm not supposed to be argumentative. I want you to get what's in yellow. I don't want you to get in white that they disagree because there's a million things we disagree about. I want you to get what is in yellow. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat, and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. Would you please just look at each other as God has accepted them? So as those chosen by God, holy and beloved, Put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, for the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And by the way, be thankful. <laughs> Be thankful. 
A lot of times we forget that be thankful part. Praise God that we're different. But praise God that we love each other because that's where perfect unity is. You want to form a more perfect unity, more perfect union? Put on love. So who messes this up? It's not God. It's not the Son. It's not the Holy Spirit. It isn't even true faith and hope that we'll talk about. It's the church. The church messes this up. The church gets outside of the unity of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We try to form a more perfect union. The perfect union is already there. We are to join the more perfect union. Therefore, I, a prisoner of the Lord, he says it again, he's begging again that you'd walk in a manner worthy. He's begging that you'll get into that unity. That's what he's begging for. A calling you which you have been called with all humility and gentleness and patience. And we talked about that, but I want to talk now about the one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. You know how many denominations there are in the world? And what's a denomination? Well, if you ever do fractions, and I know a lot of you probably hate fractions, that the bottom is a denominator. You know what the denominator is? The dom- denominator is what you divide by. That's what denominations are. Denominations are what the Christian church divides by. Right now, I don't know if this is true. It's according to Google, and you know Google's always right. But I suspect they're close. 34,000 denominations in the world today. So I want you to put that in fractions. The world divides Jesus by 34,000. So you know what the world sees in Jesus? They see one thirty-four thousandth. That's a problem. That's not forming a more perfect unity. That's dividing the perfect unity. We can't do that, people. We are the church. For even as one body, even though the body is one, yet it has many members, all of us, including all of Christians around the world. All the members are one body, though there are many, they are one body. He keeps making that point. There's many, there's a lot of you, there's a lot of you, but there's only one. There is only one body. So also is Christ only one. Not a bunch. Christ does not divide by what you believe and don't believe about him. Christ is who he is. I don't care what you believe. Well, I do care what you believe. I hope you believe that he's one. I hope you believe he's the son of God. For by one spirit we were baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks or slaves or free... We are all made to drink of one spirit. The body is not one member, but many. But again, it is one body. And we all do different stuff, okay? Don't judge everybody else by the stuff that you do, okay? You get, I, I see this a lot in the church. Evangelists, they're, they're judging everybody else because they're not as good evangelists. I see people that are very generous people are judging other people because they don't give as much. That's not how the spirit works. God gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until all obtain the unity of the faith. He gave all of you different jobs so we could all come together and benefit the kingdom. We fight about it, but it's actually the thing we're supposed to be unified about. And the knowledge of the Son of God, the mature man to the measure of the stature, which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there, the waves carried about by every wind and doctrine, by the trickery of men, by the craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we grow up in all aspects of him who is the head, even Christ. 
That's what we're doing. We're growing up to be like Christ. That last, the verse I read, the spirit of the Lord, there is freedom. The very next verse says we can be an exact mirror of Jesus. The church can be an exact mirror of Jesus if it would just join the unity. Then the world would see Jesus as one, not one thirty-four thousandth. From those who are the whole body being fitted together by what every joint supplies, what every one of you does, every little piece that each one of you does is what makes us a grand thing. According to the proper working of each individual part causes the body and the building up of itself in love. That's a perfect picture. We're forming a more perfect union. But we didn't form it. God formed it. We're joining it. One spirit. We had one body. Now we have one spirit. But to each one given the manifest of the spirit for the common good. That's why the spirit is in you. It's for the common good of everyone else. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the spirit, another the word of knowledge according to the same spirit, and another faith in the same spirit, to another gifts of healing of the same spirit, and to another the effecting of miracles, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of those tongues. But one in the same spirit works all of these things distributing to each one just as he wills it to be. One spirit. We have one hope, and this is the true hope. This isn't the hope people talk about. People talk about a lot of different things. This is the one true hope in Jesus Christ dying for our sins and us have an opportunity to be with God. Therefore, having justified by faith, we have peace through God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we obtained the introduction By faith into grace by which we stand. So we had faith in Jesus. We have faith that Jesus died for our sins and therefore we have grace. In other words, we're not going to get what we deserve. We deserve death. We are going to get heaven. And for that we exalt in the hope of the glory. And some people just stay in that hope. Okay? I'm going to go to heaven. Jesus has died for me. So now everything's good. And Paul says, you're not done yet. We don't just hope in that. It's not where our hope is. Our hope's even when things are really bad. Same hope, okay? It's not a different hope. We have the same hope even when things are really bad. Not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations. How many of you exult in your tribulations? (laughs) Not enough. Why should we exult in tribulations? Well, because we know that the tribulations bring us perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character brings us hope. And this is not a hope that disappoints. Because the love of God is poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. So no matter what's happened, I keep hearing this, you know, people are like, wow, there's really bad things happening. But there's been really bad things happening for a really long time. And as long as people are outside of God, there will be really bad things that continue. But that does not change the hope that we have. There is one Lord. Two things I had a really hard time with this message is trying to figure out what in the world verse to use for the one Lord and what verse to use for one God. Because pretty much the whole Bible is about one Lord and one God. So I picked this one. Could have picked a lot. For he, being God the Father, rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. I want you to grasp that for a second. He transferred us from the world into this perfect union. Okay? Get that. Understand that. We were in the world. We're now in. God put us in the perfect union through his Son, Jesus Christ. For whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn in all creation. For by him all things were created, both heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. 
he is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. That's our Lord. That is our Lord that has unity with the Spirit and in his unity with his Father and that we can join with because he died on the cross for us to have that opportunity to join in this perfect union. One faith. Faith is the assurance of the things that we hope for and the conviction of the things not seen. For by it, men of old gained approval. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what, we is, what is seen is not made of the things which are visible. That's the faith that we have. One faith. We have a lot of faiths. You know, people say, well, what faith do you have? Well, there isn't all really a lot of different faiths. There's one faith. When he says there's one faith, he's not talking about the 34,000 faiths that we have across denominations. He's talking about faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith in God. Faith that he sent his son as one only begotten son. That is the faith that we live by. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. That's the faith we're talking about. Only conduct yourself in a manner, again, this manner worthy. He keeps talking about this manner worthy. He's saying act like Jesus because then people will know the gospel of Christ. So that whether I come to see you or remain absent, I will hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. That's what he wants to see. Whether he's there or whether he's not there, he, he wants to hear about it if he's not there. He wants to see it if he's there. That's, that's where we want you to be. One baptism. A lot of these denominations, they're split over what kind of baptism you should have. Let me explain to you what baptism is. Baptism is, is dying to self. That's what baptism is. What you do in the baptistry up here is showing people that you have died to yourself, and now you live for Jesus Christ. That's what baptism is. For all of you are baptized into Christ, having clothed yourselves in Christ. That's what happens when we get baptized. There is neither Jew nor Greek. We talked about that before. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. You are all one. The perfect union in Christ Jesus. Therefore, we have been buried through him in baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so that we too might walk in the newness of life. For we have become united with him in the likeness of his death. Certainly, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. That's what we should be. The church should be one in the likeness of his death and truly the likeness of his resurrection. One God and Father. Again, a lot of verses I could have used. First of all, we just want to put the one that we have up with our text today. One God and Father who is over all, through all, and in all. But this is the one, I, I picked this one not because you all know it really well. I picked this one because it what gives you and I the opportunity to join the unity. Because without this, we would have no opportunity to join the unity. We could try as hard as we could. We would never be successful. We would fail miserably. But as a church, we don't have to fail miserably. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world through him might be saved. We have the opportunity to be one body under Jesus Christ as the head because God sent Jesus to die. So in conclusion, I want to read a couple pleas. One from Paul, one from Peter. Make my joy complete, being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, and united in spirit and intent on one purpose. That's what it means to be one body. Same mind, same love, same spirit, one purpose. 
and that is to win the world over to Jesus Christ so that they too can participate in the gospel and they can join the unity. And Peter, to sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. We have a wonderful gift, people. We need to share that gift in an incredible way. But first we need to humble ourselves and realize where we are out of alignment with the Spirit where we are out of alignment with the Son, where we are out of alignment with God so that he can get us in the right direction and then we can pull people with us. We spend way too much time pulling people down our own paths, going our own directions. We need to be pulling people down the path that's lit lit by the word of God. We need to be united. One more time, let me read read what we're supposed to do. Therefore, I, prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called with humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity, the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is over all and through all and in all. It's your purpose. That's what we're here for. We're here to participate in the gospel and to join in the unity. But we also have the freedom to make that choice. I, I choose, I pray that you choose God. Moses said it when he said, you can choose blessings, you can choose curses. (laughs) Up to you. I would like to inherit the blessing. (laughs) But you can choose curses. A lot of the world does. And unfortunately, some of the church does. We step out of the unity. Step back in and stay in. Walk in the spirit. Because you know what's in that unity? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's what's in that unity. But even better than that is God. There's Jesus. That's your challenge. Your challenge is first to pray. Humble yourself and pray. Get in alignment and bring everybody with you. Shall we pray? Almighty God, we're going to go into this world. Not only the Lord are they not in alignment, they're going the other direction. And, Lord, we have a choice to go your direction or theirs. Lord, so many times we think your direction is where we're already going. Lord, I pray that we humble ourselves and pray and find out if there is a misdirection in our lives. Before we ever start looking, Lord, at the speck in our brother's eye, Lord, let us take care of that log that's in our own eye. So, Lord, that we can align ourselves with you, we as the church, your church, headed by your son, Jesus Christ, and having an opportunity because of the death of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that we are part of one body. That's our challenge, to stay in that, to stay in that unity. Lord, not to form a more perfect union, but to join yours that has been perfect for all time. Lord, we thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Have a good week, everybody.